Welcome to the part two of uh, International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium that is organized with the theme uh, of pros on prosody. I'm Sung Hun Lee from International Christian University. Today we have two exciting talks uh, by Frank Kugler and uh, Nancy Kula. Let me first introduce uh, uh, the speaker of the first part, uh, Frank Kugler, uh, who is a professor doctor at Goethe University Frankfurt in Germany. Frank works on prosodic phonology in a wide range of languages, including but not limited to German Akan, spoken in Ghana and Hindi, among others. His recent project uh, investigates uh, prosody and parsing, tonal structure and information structure, synthesis and information structure, and also recursivity in prosodic phonology. He has also been working on the modeling and annotation of German intonation. Personally, I first met uh, Frank uh, at the uh, annual conference on African linguistics in 2011 uh, that was held in uh, Maryland, I think at the time in Washington, near Washington, DC. And uh, since then, uh, we met in various conferences and uh, until now, and recently uh, we met in Melbourne at the ICFAS conference uh, last August. So it's good to have you at the ICU link today. And Frank will talk about on different degrees of post focal compression. So now you can share the slide. Okay. So. Okay. I hope you can see the slides. Yes, we can see your slide. Okay. So. Thank you very much, Sun Yun, for uh, this nice introduction and for inviting me to this very interesting series on prosody talks, which you organized. That's a very, very nice uh, series, I think. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be part of it. So today I want to talk about um, post-focal compression. Okay. The proposal I want to make is that um, there are different types of uh, post-focal compression and what we know from um, prosodic focus marking is that um, there are uh, different strategies how languages mark focus prosodically. Um, mainly um, these uh, prosodic focus marking relate to prosodic cues which are on the focused, uh, realized on the focus constituent. Many languages, however, um, also show prosodic cues after the focus constituents, uh, which has been, uh, well, we, which we can uh, call post-focal compression, uh, which had also been mentioned, deaccentuation or as dephrasing. One observation when we look at, uh, at the variety of post-focal compression across the languages is that the degree of post-focal compression differs between languages. And this is the topic um, of the talk um, today. So my proposal uh, I want to give here is that um, there are two distinct types of post-focal compression in the languages. Uh, one type is a partial post-focal compression and one type is a complete post-focal compression. And what I want to propose here is that this differing degree of post-focal compression is actually a consequence of the phonology of a language governing the need to express the functional load of tones or um, accent located in the post-focal domain. I will give a brief introduction to the topic and then I will discuss post-focal compression um, from uh, various uh, different perspectives. Um, its relation to focus, its relation to the distribution in different language families or language varieties <clears throat> in relation to givenness and also discussing, discussing structural constraints. A second part will be about a general, generally speaking about the function of tones and accents. And the, the last part then will be the proposal of the functional load hypothesis saying that's actually the phonology of a language um, that decides which uh, type of post-focal compression exists in a language. So focus usually is expressed um, prosodically on the focus constituent uh, and post-focal effects are found 
has been called as the accentuation in languages like English and German, the phrasing um, in languages like Korean, for instance, and also as post-focus compression in languages like Mandarin. According to the work by Yi Xu, um, there seems to be a language division um, into languages that employ post-focal compression and languages that do not have post-focal compression. And Ishu put forth the Nostratic superfamily language hypothesis for that, um, claiming that post-focal compression is an inherited feature um, from a common proto-language. And <clears throat> post-focal compression is rather lost through language contact and it's not acquired. So that's the reason why some languages that would belong to this common proto-language um, do not show post-focal compression any longer. Um, he also makes the point that prosodic um, features like stress tone or morphosyntactic markers of focus um, do not predict the presence or absence of post-focal compression, which is uh, in line with uh, claims that I want to propose here that post-focal compression and focus, prosodic focus marking are in, in fact independent um, things. So the proposal is that there are two distinct types of post-focal compression, partial and complete focus compression, and the phonology plays a crucial role uh, in deciding which type of compression is working in a language. To give you a very brief um, overview of what I mean with post-focal compression, I hope to be able to show this with the pointer, yes. Um, here, <clears throat> here you see a plot of um, um, F0 measurements from German sentences, which start with a verb initial um, and then different uh, number of arguments following the verb. We have a focus on the verb and then the post-focal region in a very compressed pitch register. And there's small little bumps here indicating that there are um, actually post-focal accents realized, but in a very compressed register. And on the, uh, on the right side, you see plots from Hindi sentences, subject or object verb sentences, where you observe the characteristic rises of uh, Hindi constituents. Um, and what you see here is that the black line and the black dashed line uh, go well hand in hand but there is a reduction going on here when the subject is in focus. We see the post-focal compression here, which is not that complete as in German, that dramatically uh, compressed, but still the rise is realized. So we have two different types of, of compression going on here, the complete shape in German and rather partial shape in Hindi. <clears throat> so the first part of the, talk will be about the nature of post-focal compression, as I put it. Um, at first sight, when we look at the prosodic marking of focus, we may, be, uh, we may observe a broad range of, of different focus marking strategies across the languages. In a recent proposal, um, Sasha Calhoun and myself are proposing three different strategies that the languages of the world employ to mark prosodic focus. So either they use stress-based cues as uh, in English or German, where um, there are local F0 cues, duration, intensity, voice quality, uh, signaling the focus, um, the focused word. There are other languages using phrase-based cues um, where mainly the duration plays a crucial role in the, um, in the signaling of phrase boundaries. Um, and then there are also languages which use register-based cues where the pitch register lines um, are referred to, which is rather a global F0 cue, and they may expand or um, reduce or compress. So these uh, the languages uh, which mark prosodic focus can be grouped into these different strategies, um, but mainly these strategies refer to prosodic cues which are realized on the focus constituent. And as I said before, post-focal effects 
has been mentioned in the literature with different names like post focus compression, de accentuation, or dephrasing. Um, and we want to look a little bit more on the post focal compression facts. Some claims about post focal compression are given here. So the first one is that the post focal compression is independent or orthogonal to strategies of prosodic focus marking. So whether a language uses stress-based cues, phrase-based cues, or register-based cues has nothing to do with whether the language uses post-focal compression or not. Post-focal compression is not necessarily a feature of, typological, of a typological language family or of language varieties. Um, and I would also say post-focal compression is not necessarily an effect of givenness. Of course, it is highly correlated. So we will look into uh, givenness a little bit more, into lowering effects which depend on the position in the sentence, and the lowering also depends on structural conditions, like in French. I will also go into details of newness and how givenness and newness affect pitch register scaling. The first one. Um, so, Given that we um, have languages that use stress-based, phrase-based, and register-based cues, um, let's, look, let's look at uh, different languages, um, what they, these do with post-focal um, prosody. In German, for instance, or English, which is uh, very similar, um, we have the general assumption that, that um, stress-based cues are realized on the focus constituent, and you see here in A, um, uh, early focus in the sentence. So Peter stole the cookie after the sentence. There's uh, almost flat F0. Compared to a broad focus realization, Peter stole the cookie, where we have the accents on Peter and cookie. Um, the domain of post-focal compression uh, in German and English starts immediately after the accented syllable of the focused word. We have um, the example here with the green triangle, um, das grüne Dreieck. So you have the accent on the adjective and immediately after the stressed syllable, we find the um, drop down in F0 and the low um, flat F0 curve. Um, the scaling of focal accent is identical independent of sentence length, independent of the number of arguments and constituents in a language, which is shown here in a plot where we have a first constituent, a second constituent, even a third constituent and fourth constituent. What we see is that the scaling of the focal accent, which is displayed here, um, always reaches the same um, level relative to the, to the pitch register. So this is data from German, but this holds also for English. In comparison, um, let's look at the Italian cases where a study on the um, focus marking of, uh, uh, of these uh, different noun phrase types where we have a, an adjective and a noun, and the focus is either on the adjective or on the noun, Swartz and Kramer um, showed data that if there is a focus on the um, adjective, an early focus, there is no um, such post-focal compression as we've seen in, uh, for German on the slide before, but we have the same accentual shape for broad focus and narrow focus. So there's no post-focal compression in a language like Italian, which uh, we can say, safely say that Italian also uses stress-based cues to mark focus. So within the group of stress-based languages, we find uh, languages that allows post-focal compression like German, English, and many, many more, and Italian uh, and other, some, some other Romance languages or varieties of Spanish which show no post-focal compression. Let's turn to the next um, group of languages, the phrase base, which use phrase-based cues to mark focus prosodically. Um, Korean would be one case of this, where um, Sun, uh, Sun uh, Jan and uh, colleagues worked a lot on the prosody of Korean, and they were 
showing data from different perspectives, arguing for kind of uh, dephrasing effect in the, um, in the post focal domain. So when we take the um, sentence in five here, the um, prosodic phrasing and broad focus should be something like uh, here we have each phonological phrase starting with a rising tone pattern and ending in a rising tone pattern. Um, and if we have a narrow focus somewhere in the phrase, then after that, there's no more um, these typical rising of phonological phrases left. So this is the dephrasing pattern here. And looking at actual F0 data from Korean, from a study from uh, Jan and Kim, we see the green line here, which uh, shows that the second word, the indirect object, is in focus. And after the focus, we find the drop down in F0, which indicates that the scaling of these uh, constituents uh, and the tones there are compressed. On the other hand, um, a language which does not show any post-focal compression effects uh, is uh, Chichewa, where we do find prosodic reflexes of um, phrasing in uh, relation to focus. So the example from Kanerva here in seven um, shows that uh, the typic one typical um, aspect of many Bantu languages that there's uh, antepenult uh, phrasal lengthening. So we have the antepenult syllable, which is lengthened here. We have two vowels. And if a phrase a break is inserted due to focus, then uh, we have this lengthening here in the antepenult position of the phrase. And again, we have this phrasal lengthening um, going on here. So we have prosodic reflexes of uh, focus marking in that language, but there's no report on any post focal compression effects. Um, finally, the, uh, the group of languages which use register-based cues, uh, where Mandarin is one of the exponents and well-researched uh, language on um, register changes due to focus. This is the, the picture taken from Yi Xu's study from 1999, where he compared the different tone patterns. And I just uh, give you the example here with the high tone sentences. So this is the high tone sentence in neutral focus. And if there's an initial focus, we see the focal raising of the pitch register and post focal compression of the pitch register. Even in medial focus, there's um, compression afterwards. Hong Kong Cantonese, on the other hand, shows these on focus raising effects. So we see here, in the red line, this is the focus, the initial focus, which is raised relative to the um, other um, conditions. Here we have the medial focus, the green line, which is raised relative to the other conditions. But what we do not see is that the red line dramatically um, lowers or is realized in a compressed register. It goes hand in hand with the other uh, conditions. So there is no post focal compression in a language where you see the on focus register um, expansion effects. To sum up this part, we have um, languages from the different um, prosodic focus marking types, which both show and do not show um, post focal compression. This means that the, um, the type, how a language uh, marks the focus prosodically, has no implication on what is following after the focus, what the prosody does after the, the focus. So there's no direct relation, there's no prediction from one to the other. Okay, so the next point is to say that PFC is not, post focal compression is not a feature of a particular language family or a particular uh, property of language varieties. Um, the studies by Xu and colleagues, Wang and colleagues, analyzed different Chinese languages um, of different language families and same identical language families 
And they showed um, like the Mandarin and Cantonese case, which we've just seen, that um, actually there are languages which have post-focal compression and others which haven't. Interestingly, from a perception perspective, um, speakers from a non-post-focal compression language cannot really perceive focus uh, in a, a post-focal perception, a post-focal compression language. That's an interesting uh, feature. So um, they they do not have the phonology, the phonological feature of post-focal compression in their grammar, so they don't react to it in, in a different second language. From Germanic languages, we know that um, almost all, if not all, employ post-focal compression. So we've seen data from German, there's data on Dutch, English, Swedish, Icelandic. However, there is a crucial difference between um, the degree of compression. So if we look at Swedish and Icelandic, for instance, uh, we see that pitch register compression is only partial. There are tones realized and you can perceive these tones in the post-focal uh, domain. Whereas in German, Dutch, English, and further varieties, um, there is complete compression. And it's really hard to detect any uh, post-focal tones. There might be some post-focal prominences and pitch accents, but the type of pitch accents are not really uh, perceived. And also varieties of the same language show different post-focal compression effects. That's uh, an example for Arabic on the next slide, taken from Kahal and Helmut, where we see the cases from uh, Lebanese Arabic that mirrors very much the cases of, of German and English. After the initial focus, there is almost flat of zero. Uh, whereas in Egyptian Arabic, we have an initial focus and then we still see clearly um, uh, at zero movements in the post-focal domain, though in a compressed pitch register. Um, if we take the claim proposed here that post-focal compression is not necessarily a feature of a typological language family, this may uh, go against the claim um, by Xu and colleagues on the Nostratic superfamily hypothesis. So this, this uh, hypothesis uh, predicts that all languages that belong to that family should show post-focal compression or should have shown post-focal compression in the, in the uh, previously. Those that lack post-focal compression, um, that's the claim, have lost that feature. Um, it is, however, not really clear what this losing means and if it's not possible at all to acquire post-focal compression in a second language. So the claim behind this hypothesis is that PFC is rather lost and not acquired um, through language contact. And uh, even Xu mentioned this in the, in the paper, and I would uh, say this too, um, there's much more evidence needed to underpin these, um, these claims, of course. So my prediction uh, rather concerns a synchronic level that the membership of a language family or uh, of a language variety does not predict the presence or absence of post-focal compression. Um, and it does not either predict any type of post-focal compression, be it partial or complete. So that's the realization in the post-focal prosody is not dependent on the language family. Um, now, the issue of givenness. Of course, post-focal compression uh, and givenness are highly correlated, but what is the exact nature between givenness, newness, and post-focal con constituents? So there's a model um, proposed in Ferry and Ishihara 2010, which uh, is given here schematically from that paper. The default realization uh, gives some reference, uh, some, some register lines here, and the focus just boost, boosts a reference line, uh, which we have seen in different, uh, for different languages. And then the proposal is that givenness, on the other hand, reduces or lowers the reference lines. It gets even more complicated when we have a focus which is given. 
So we leave this part um, aside here. If we take this uh, idea that given as low as the reference lines, we see some, uh, some facts that um, speak against a direct influence of givenness onto the pitch register. So we don't see this lowering in all languages. We don't see this lowering um, to be identical in all positions in the sentence. So there's a crucial distinction between pre and post focal compression. We do not see this lowering effect in all domains. Um, and we don't see the lowering to the same degree. Um, so let's look through the data um, which, are, uh, which are out there. Prefocal constituents are realized lower than new ones in German. And this is in line with the model. So from the, from the study, from our study, Freire and Kugler 2008, this is taken out here where we have uh, measured the um, uh, sentence intonation in German in different sentence lengths, different word orders, um, and uh, we were looking at different information structure conditions. So here we have in A the neutral situation which we compare all the other cases with, this is an all new sentence, the scaling of the um, initial constituent. In B we have a focus on the initial constituent and you clearly see the focal boosting going on here. In C we have uh, a given constituent and it's clearly seen the focal lowering, post-focal lowering going on here. Oh no, this is not post-focal, it's pre-focal lowering, sorry. Um, but then this uh, constituent in D is also given and there is a different degree of the prefocal lowering, uh, whether in C this constituent is before a focus constituent or in D this constituent is before another given constituent. So givenness does not directly lowers, but there are more factors that are relevant to take into account to see the exact, um, the exact amount of lowering. In Hindi, on the other hand, you see here uh, subject object verb sentences again, the F0 um, curve of these sentences. And the black line is the white focus, blue line is the object focus, and the red line is the subject focus. So what we see here is uh, compression, of course, uh, uh, post focal position, but not in pre focal position. So in pre focal position, these constituents are given. Um, we don't see any uh, lowering of, the, of uh, given constituents. So this is not in line with the model that says givenness in generally lowers um, pitch register. Um, as I already said, the position also matters. So in German, what we see uh, is that we have a reduction in prominence uh, in the post-focal position and a reduction in prominence in the uh, prefocal position. And if we take the metrical grid here, uh, we see that each phonological phrase uh, receives uh, its uh, metrical beat. Um, so we have the first constituent, the second constituent, and then the third constituent. Um, we have the focus here, which is receives the sentence level highest prominence in this case, but there is virtually no difference between the metrical prominence of a prefocal constituent and a postfocal constituent. So this is um, actually from, from the um, un abstract representation that there is no difference, but of course the lowering effect of these givenness, uh, given constituents is different. Here we have a pitch accent realized and here we have a complete compression going on. Okay, so French is another case um, which does not have word stress in the sense like um, German and English, um, but employs phrase tones. And what is clear in French is that there is no clear pattern of focus marking. Um, or although researchers observe that in the post-focal region, post-focal de-accenting or compression um, takes place. Um, 
However, in a, in a study by Caroline Ferry, we uh, see the data that post-focal compression only takes place in one third of the cases, which means that this cue is just an optional cue of focus marking in French. Um, and we do not see post-focal compression within, uh, within the M uh, nominal phrase domain. So when we have purple field mouse here, uh, on, there's focus on the noun, which is similar to the Italian case, which I've shown there before. Um, also, there's a difference in phrasing patterns between an argument in the sentence and uh, an adjunct in the sentence. And this phrasing, which is, uh, which is given the dif differences in phrasing, which are given here, also lead to uh, different prosodic realizations in focus and post-focus um, parts. So the structural conditions which lie behind here also have a crucial impact on the realization of the post-focal um, domain. Now let's turn to post-focal new constituents. Um, there's, a, there's a famous study by Katz and Selkirk, uh, 2011, analyzing um, focus constituents that are either preceded uh, or followed by new constituents. So constituents not mentioned in the previous discourse before. What they find is, that all the constituents are pitch accented and uh, the post-focal uh, new constituents or the uh, pre-focal new constituents are generally shorter than the focused ones. So the focal lengthening um, amounts up to 11%, which is actually in line with uh, data from German and Swedish. Um, their proposal is that the metrical uh, grid structure looks like this. We have the focus constituent here with the highest prominence at the level of the intonation phrase. The other phonological phrase receives its uh, phonological hat here by pitch, ac pitch accent marking. If we have just the condition where we only have new constituents in the sentence in 11c, um, we observe the following. We, the proposal by Katz and Selkirk is that um, each constituent is marked by a pitch accent, but there is no single um, intonation phrase level pitch accent. But there are two, actually two nuclear accents as they put it in the, in the paper. Um, okay, so this is definitely a, a departure from, from the um, well-known assumptions that uh, there's only one nuclear accent in an intonation phrase, and this is certainly a matter that can be discussed uh, in a different uh, talk and different experiments. New information is, however, not necessarily accented, as uh, Ferri and Samek Lodovici showed in this example, an American farmer was talking to a Canadian farmer. The farmer is new in the first instance, has not, not been mentioned before, um, but new material within the same phonological phrase um, may still receive reduced prominence. So here we have the contrast between American and Canadian. This um, makes the farmer not prominent. And also, Neloman and Sendroy uh, were discussing about the so-called Superman uh, sentences, as they put it, where we have in a, in a uh, contrast reading on Superman, Johnny was reading Superman to some kid, uh, where we have new material within the same phonological phrase, but this, which still may receive an accent and some prominence after the focus. Um, I do not know of any uh, detailed instrumental study on the prosodic details of post-focal new material in comparison to post-focal given material, especially in these cases, um, in the Superman cases and other cases. So uh, I think there's still uh, still needs some clarification um, to be to get more data on the way how post-focal new material differs from post-focal um, given material. 
What is uh, interesting, however, is the the similarity in the in the two different proposals on postfocal given and postfocal new materials. So when we compare the German cases where we had um, postfocal um, prominences indicated by the um, metrical grid marking here on the postfocal constituent, marking the head of this um, phonological phrase. This is a given uh, information here. The same and identical um, prominence marking, grid marking, uh, was proposed by Katz and Selkirk for the English cases where we have new information after the focus. So um, there is a clear clash here in the, in the proposal how the, um, the, the phonological metrical grid marking looks like between given and new constituents. And um, it may become clear that uh, given it itself does not really predict post-focal compression. Um, and it doesn't really predict the degree of register lowering which is going on. But on the other hand, newness does not necessarily ac uh, predict accentedness either. So um, there are clear tendencies. And I would say the, cl the, the clear tendency is that post-focal constituents are generally given uh, post constituents that are realized in a post focal compressed pitch register are generally um, given. So we've seen this comparison in the very beginning to illustrate the different degrees of, uh, of lowering. So what we see here, the, the um, sharp drop down from a focused pitch accent in, uh, in German and the post focal compressed pitch register and here we see the post focal compressed pitch register which is not that dramatic and the rising tones are still realized in Hindi. There are other um, data from other languages which so show exactly the same um, pattern. So here you see the data from Greek study by Grilia 2008 showing that in case of initial focus here, after the focus, there's a dramatic drop down and an almost flat F0 curve compared to um, other <clears throat> information structure conditions. And here you see the finished cases where the gray dashed line shows an initial focus. And after that focus, there's a reduction going on of the typical rises. The rises are these phrase tones are still realized though in a redu and reduced pitch register. And even for medial focus, <clears throat> we see this reduction going on in Finnish. And the same holds for um, Swedish and uh, the complete compression pattern is also found in Estonian, for instance. So to give a summary of that part, what I've Try to show you is that um, post focal compression is orthogonal to strategies of prosodic focus marking, so that um, PFC is not predicted by, uh, by the type of prosodic focus marking. And um, I've shown you that post focal compression types and realization is not necessarily a feature of a language family or varieties of some uh, language. And post focal compression is not necessarily an effect of <coughs> givenness. Of course, it's highly correlated, but um, I would say that constituents that are realized in a post focal compressed pitch register are generally given. So, from this perspective, um, the, it holds. And what we have seen um, that there are, we have seen that there are two distinct types of post focal compression. Those who are complete compressed and those uh, lang in those languages where the postfocal area is only partially compressed. Now let's turn to the function of tones briefly. Um, we, which kinds of functions do we see in the, in the languages? There are lexical tones, there are lexical pitch accents, and then there are post-lexical or I would say intonational tones. Okay. So um, lexical tones have a clear lexical function like in Mandarin Chinese. This is the classical example of the four different Mandarin tones. Um, and you see the phonetic implementation of the tones here, distinguishing high, high rising, low or, and falling um, tones. 
Tone may also have grammatical function, where in an example here coming from the Bantu language Shona, um, where the distinction of the tones here, which starts here, um, shows a dif difference between a main clause and a relative clause. Lexical pitch accents known from languages like um, Swedish, for instance, also distinguish words. Um, and we have a classic example here from the, uh, oops, from, from Swedish, um, where we have accent one and accent two. The crucial distinction between accent one and accent two is the um, position of the act word accent fall. In accent one, the word accent fall starts before the um, word, and in accent two words, the word accent fall starts at the beginning of the accent two word. So it's a timing, timing difference uh, between these two accents. I can give you the, an impression of what it uh, sounds like. Oops. Anden. Anden. So you may hear the difference between the two. Um, and this means uh, that the pitch accents also have a lexical function. Of course, there are further international tones after the pitch accent fall, which we are not discussing here now. Then prosodic tone, uh, international tones uh, usually have two different functions. The first function is to highlight information. Uh, we have here the example from German, um, what's up? And the answer is Mrs. Lina wants to paint flowers. And here the question is who wants to paint flowers? Uh, and here we have uh, Mrs. Lina in focus. So we have the focal boosting and the post focal compression part after that. Um, the information here is um, highlighted uh, by the implementation of prosodic focus marking. On the other hand, pitch accents, boundary tones, also structure information. And the um, classical view from uh, phonology is that, the, um, that a pitch accent signals um, the head of a prosodic phrase. So when we have the grid mark here again, we have uh, at the phonological phrase level, which Kratz, Kratz and Selkirk call major phrase in her paper 2007, um, showing that these um, grid marks represent the head of the phonological phrase and we find pitch accent realized on offices and ballerinas. Information, uh, intonation carries also meaning. So um, there are only a few models on the, on the meaning of intonation out there, but uh, somehow the agreement is that the international uh, categories not only show phonological distinctions between high and low, but they, they also carry um, sentence meaning, pragmatic meaning in the sense uh, given very briefly here that for instance, a high star adds new information, a low star signals given information and uh, boundary tones um, signal the relation to, of that uh, utterance uh, to, the, to the surrounding discourse. So in this case, I will buy flowers. Um, the high star adds new information to the common ground of the listener and speaker, um, and the low percent signals that the, this new information is uh, final and um, that the listeners can take this, into, uh, this new information into the into their common ground. So we've seen that um, there are some phonological contrasts marked by lexical tones, lexical pitch accents, and post-lexical tones or intonational tones have two functions. One is um, carrying and expressing pragmatic meaning, and the other one is to signal structure, um, like a pitch accent uh, is the head of a prosodic constituent. Now, coming to a an, uh, an final part of the talk, the functional hypothesis, um, we move these things together, which we've seen before, the uh, independence of this post-focal compression phenomena and the functional tones. Um, and I want to discuss this from a, from a broader perspective on um, phonetic and phonological reduction phenomena. 
phonological categories usually have a functional load. And as I just uh, presented, tones also have this functional load. So it's not only the segments which carry functional loads, but also tones. But uh, we also see that reduction diminishes phonological contrast. Um, and there's, uh, there are a lot of studies looking at reduction phenomena from different perspectives. But what is, what is in common is that in cases of reduction, we observe less clear articulation and shorter segmental duration. Um, predictability is one factor, uh, has, been, has been argued to be one factor uh, influencing the kind and type of reduction phenomen phenomena. Linguistic uh, uh, predictability has been used differently uh, in, in linguistics and phonology. On the one hand, we started out with linguistic binarity, where we predicted in a certain context or by rule how a given segment changes into a different segment in terms of allophonic, allophonic variation, for instance. More recently, predictability has become a note of gradiency. Um, and there's, a, there's an interesting overview article by Sho and Kawahara in 2018 on a special issue on the predictability in phonology where um, all these things are uh, discussed in detail. The point here is that um, this gradiency, um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, the, the gradiency refers to facts like uh, frequency of occurrence, bigram uh, predictability, and so on. Post-focal compression is uh, definitely a phenomenon of reduction. It's a reduction of prominence. Um, the interesting case is that um, it's, although it's a reduction phenomenon, um, it's not really uh, like other reduction phenomena found in, uh, in, in phonology. So in terms of duration, uh, uh, reduction usually diminishes phonological contrasts with shorter segmental duration. In case of, uh, of post-focal constituents, however, there is some evidence, not enough, but there is some initial evidence that um, the duration of, of given constituent uh, is identical compared uh, to new constituents. Um, on the other hand, pitch accents in German and English are almost completely reduced. So it's not, in this case, it's not the duration, but the, the, the prosodic realization of pitch accents. On the other hand, other tones, like in Swedish, Mandarin, Hindi, Finnish, and many more languages, other tones are clearly realized. So um, the prosodic reduction of post focal compression is somehow predictable. After a focus, there's a reduction in prominence. But uh, how this uh, reduction in prominence is achieved differs between the languages. And the degree of reduction is not predictable from focus or givens. Instead, and that's the claim, what I want to, want to make here today is, it's the phonology of a language that predicts the degree of post-focal compression. Again, this, um, this comparative picture here, the focus accent, the, the nuclear accent in German and English expresses um, the meaning. So here we uh, here the, the speaker expresses that this is important information to take into the um, speaker and hear our common ground. Post focal pitch accents, which are realized in a compressed pitch register, do not add any meaning to that uh, to that intonation or meaning expression. In Hindi, on the other hand, we see that the typical rises on a phrase are realized and um, so, so that, the, that the tones are still there, similar to Finnish and other languages. Um, and these tones seem to have an implication for the parsing of the individual constituents in Hindi. So they seem to have a function which is needed um, for the listener to parse the sentence. There's a recent study on um, Hindi post-focal compression uh, where I, uh, just very briefly to explain this, where I had contrastive 
ellipsis structures. Uh, we had sentences with the subject, indirect object, ob direct object, verb, and the contrast is either with the indirect object or with the direct object. And when the indirect object is in contrast, this is the red line, we observe post-focal compression here. When the direct object is in contrast, there was expected to be some post-focal compression on the verb, but this was not found. That's a different story. But um, this kind of post-focal compression was there when the indirect object was in contrast. So I run a sentence completion study where listeners had to listen to the first part of these uh, of this elliptic uh, sentences and had to choose two options to, uh, to complete the sentence with. And what the data show is that this is the crucial point here, when the post-focal compression is present, then listeners were able to correctly um, uh, end the sentence. Whereas when this prosodic uh, Q was not present, then the um, decision rates were at chance level. So post-focal compression carries a certain function, in this case, uh, the function of, of focus uh, recognition or focus identification. The prediction so far, the phonology of a language governs the need to express the functional load of tones in the post-focal area. When we look at the different tones, which we have seen, <clears throat> then we have lexical tone with lexical distinctions, and the post-focal compression is partial. Mandarin post-focal area, the tones, the high and low rising tones are realized, so um, the phonology demands them to be there. For, for the grammatical function, I do not have any language example. Lexical pitch accents, like in Swedish, are also realized in the post-focal uh, part, and um, the compression is only partial. Also phrase tones, like in Hindi was, or Finnish, are realized in the um, post-focal area because the demarcation, the phrasing is relevant for um, the listener. So here also the phonology demands this uh, partial uh, realization. Whereas pitch accents, expressing pragmatic meanings, Intonational tune is already done by the focus accent. So after the focus, there's not much more meaning uh, addition from the intonation. And so the phonology <clears throat> has no rule to play here. And we can say that that's the reason why we have a complete post focal compression type here. Okay, so post focal compression to conclude. It's not predicted by the type of prosodic focus marking. It's not predicted by the affiliation with the language fam family. It's not directly predicted by givenness, but of course uh, the constituents in that area are usually given. And post-focal compression may be a pro prosodic property of a language belonging to the nostratic superfamily language, according to Xu. However, the condition of loss of post-focal compression or acquisition of post-focal compression are still unclear. Um, so my claim would be to say that we've observed two different kinds of uh, post-focal compression distinctions, completely compressed pitch register and partially compressed pitch register. And it's the phonology that determines which type exists in a given language. The partial compression means that the phonology demands a high need to express the functional load of post-focal tones, whereas in complete compression, the phonology demands a low need to express functional load of tones, of post-focal tones. <clears throat> and a final example, uh, giving as, an ex uh, as a prediction here, a note on Japanese. And I haven't gone through all the data on Japanese so far, but as a first impression, I would predict that in Japanese, partial post-focal compression occurs, although some researchers claim uh, post-focal dephrasing um, going on. But uh, post-focal pitch accents appear to be realized, and I took some data from uh, Shin Ishihara's thesis here to illustrate that after a focus, um, the pitch accent high tone is still realized. So it's not flat until the end, but there is some 
um, high tone realized here, although in a uh, compressed pitch register, of course. And uh, some duration patterns also may point to post focal phrasing that is um, still intact. So my prediction would be that Japanese counts as an example into the group of partial post-focus um, compression languages. And with this, I would like to thank you and uh, I'm happy for questions. And of course, I would like to thank uh, many colleagues, uh, among them Caroline, who is here today, the audience of the Phonology Club at Goethe University Frankfurt, three anonymous reviewers uh, and the editors of a special issue in Glossa, Sophie Repp, Johannes Moselle, for their extensive discussion and fruitful um, comments on this paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Frank. And uh, I sent a message to everyone saying, if you have a question, send your name and affiliation to as a, a private message to Sung Hun Lee. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Katharina Lee at University of Cambridge. Uh, you may turn on your video when you ask question, but you should be able to turn off, uh, unmute your microphone. Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kugler. I really like your presentation. And I think your hypothesis about functional load really makes sense to me, especially in explaining the distinction between partial compression and complete compression. My question is, how would you explain the distinction between no compression and words, with compression? Like you mentioned French, um, like what prevents French or Italian to behave like German or English? Like what, what's the functional what was the function of the tones in these languages? Yeah, so thank you. thank you for thank you for that question. That's of course the the part which I left out for now because we have languages that do not show post focal compression at all. Um, and this is, I think, uh, another study to do um, because uh, I, I'm not sure if if there is only one explanation to um, to give that uh, a language does not use uh, post-focal compression. So of course, as a starting point, again, issue study can be one of the, uh, of, can be one of the starting points saying that, okay, languages that do not belong to this uh, nostratic super family language do not show post-focal compression for whatever reason the phonology does in these languages. So we may exclude a large group of languages, which still has to be shown. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to say that's the case, but this could be a starting point. And then there are languages uh, that may belong to this uh, language group. And uh, we would like to see that the maybe even the phonology requires some, some, um, constraints that the tones there be realized but maybe it's not the phonology so if i if i think on the romans cases the italian cases and also varieties of spanish it may well be that uh, it is a combination of the phonology and uh, syntax for instance which uh, demands that there are um, some pitch accents uh, realized so we we know from some romance languages that there are high requirements to have the nuclear prominence at the very end of the sentence and if there is a focus before we still need this final um, this final prominence so it could be principles like this that um, uh, rule out post-focal compression in these cases. But um, yeah, thank you for this question. And this is another study to do. Thank you. Yep. I think the next question is from Cedric Potter uh, at the University of Lille. Hi, Frank. Uh, Hi, Cedric. This is very thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, I have some questions on the predictions uh, you would made based on your uh, idea. Um, so you know that in uh, Eastern Bantu, there are languages where tones are active, but uh, you have a lack of contrast. Uh, for instance, in Shingazija, the language I mostly work on, uh, tones are very active. They shift, they delete all the tones, etc. But there are very few uh, minimal pairs and 
uh, etc. So I would expect from what you said that a prediction would be that in such a language you would have uh, complete uh, compression because of the lack of functional contrast, even if the tones are active. And a related uh, prediction I would uh, know it, uh, if uh, the functional uh, aspect is what is important, you will not expect a lot of uh, inter-speaker variation, right, in a given language. Thank yeah, you. thank you for, this, for, the, for these questions, Cedric. Um, in fact, that's the, the Eastern Bantu case, that's an interesting point. Um, so you mentioned that there is no phonological contrast between high and low tone. This is the phonological, uh, well, this is the phonological assumptions for many Bantu languages, yes. Um, what, I, what I'm not sure about is uh, whether still some languages uh, or some, some cases could fall into the post focal the, the partial post focal compression types because tones still have um, a function within the phonology in case of high tone spread for instance so the the, the, the tones still mark some phonological properties or so phrasing for instance which uh, can be thought of as, as having high functional load and, the, and the, the phonology may demand this to be expressed. Yeah. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that directly that these languages fall into the complete uh, register compression case, not necessarily. The, the other issue is with inter-speaker variability. Indeed, yes. So uh, I would say that um, speakers uh, should behave somehow similar. Uh, so let's take the Mandarin case, which is a very clear case, of course, where you need to distinguish ma, ma, uh, even post focally, otherwise you, you get lost. Um, so I think that speakers still uh, realize, but have, of course, different pitch ranges, and you may hear the, the the contrast better or, or less better. Um, but I would predict less um, variability in these cases, less inter-speaker variability, which is true. But of course, we see reduction phenomena in a lot of cases. And also there, the speakers could choose to reduce to such an amount that the contrasts are lost. But then, of course, interestingly, it would be to test this uh, variation if speakers completely reduce their contrast do do other listeners react to that do listeners would still perceive the contrast or would they be lost so if the listeners would be lost then we also have a clear explanation well speakers do not produce anything but they can't be heard anymore they can't be understand understood anymore thank you Yes, thank you. The last question uh, for Frank uh, comes from Lena Boris uh, at uh, uh, Academy of Science in Hungary and Harvard University. Um, hello, and thank you so much for this talk. This was very, very interesting. Um, I found it especially interesting that you demonstrated so convincingly that there is indeed a striking variation with respect to the degree of post-focal compression, especially in languages that are each other. Um, and so my question is about whether, um, whether it is possible to make any generalizations uh, from post-focal compression to post-WH compression uh, in these languages. And I'm wondering specifically because, of course, depending on one's approach, focus and WH, uh, WH words may either be treated as the same or different kind of animal. Um, and so I was wondering if you have made any observations with respect to this and if there are indeed any similarities. Thank you, Lina, for this question. Um, very interesting question. Uh, the, the, the short and quick answer is no, I have no idea. But it's an, it's an interesting observation that you made. Of course, yes, WH and focus is treated often the same. Um, well, in other cases, people argue against that, but uh, I know many cases where it's treated the same. I have no idea whether um, I can extend this kind of post focal compression parts to post WH compression. Uh, I have 
not looked into it. I have no no data right now, and uh, but it would be an interesting case to follow up, of course, to to see where the similarities are, whether there are similarities. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this concludes uh, uh, Frank's talk. Uh, let's give him a, an applause, like with a reaction, maybe. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. And uh, now um, uh, the uh, recording will be stopped.